going to be uh, pushing at uh, at McMaster. A little bit of background here. Uh, Laura Beaupre is uh, the Director of Research Analysis and Reporting at the University of Guelph. Um, and Baron Wolf is at the University of Kentucky, where he is the Assistant Vice President for Research Strategy and Data Analytics. And uh, Hugh uh, was uh, involved in the INORMS Working Group um, as a representative of the Society for Research Administrators International. Um, and he was active in the development uh, of the SCOPE model for uh, research, uh, responsible research evaluation. Super, and I will pass the baton over to, uh, who's presenting, is it Laura or uh, Baron? Uh, Baron currently has presenters, right? Check. Okay. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, Laura, uh, do you see the, the screen without the notes? Yes, we've got your okay. uh, full PowerPoint view now, presenter view. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so uh, just to give you a quick context, um, I'll be presenting half of the slide deck and then Laura will be presenting another half. INORMS is the International Network of uh, Organized Research Management Societies. It's an international group of um, all of the research administrative societies like SRAI and NCURA. And we are a, a large group that's been working on a couple different uh, work packages related to the responsible uh, research evaluation space. And so what I'm going to talk about uh, at the beginning is our scope model. So introducing a model for uh, evaluating research responsibly. So thank you for allowing us this time and I'll get right into the slide deck because we have a little bit, uh, only 20 minutes, I believe. So, so introducing scope and of course scope uh, is a five step process where we use this acronym uh, and we're now in the process as an international group of workshopping scope in different research evaluation settings to both develop the model and also write some use cases so that we can help others that want to apply this approach uh, to actually running responsible research evaluation within their organizations. Uh, and that's why we're here today to talk about this. As you see here, uh, the scope model uh, starts with what we value. We want to talk about the context in which we are evaluating uh, the different options that might be available to us. We, all, we don't always have to use metrics for evaluation, and so we want to make sure that we look at different options. And then P is for probe deeply, where we probe and really um, make sure the context and options that we're considering are really what we think that they are. And then, of course, as any evaluative process, we want to make sure that we evaluate that evaluation and make sure that our, our model is working and, and close that loop. <clears throat> so, scope starts with S, and it's about what we value. Uh, and so, what does this mean? Uh, it might sound obvious, but to but all too often, we don't really start evaluations here. We often start with what others value, what ranking agencies value, what funders value, versus really what uh, uh, our institutions and our organizations and our missions tell us to value. And so we really believe that the scope should start um, uh, uh, what we value and not so much about uh, what's available in the data. So we don't just look at what we're valuing because the data exists. So it's similar to this uh, cartoon here illustrated by the street light effect uh, where someone loses their wallet and the, the police officer says, well, where is your wallet? And well, I lost it over there while walking, but why are you looking here? You're looking here because that's where the light is. And so we want to remember that uh, not don't focus your evaluation or what we value just because the data exists. We want to think beyond that. Uh, and so we find that many evaluations rely on bibliometric data, not because of the volume of publications or even the citedness is actually what we value, but because it is so readily available and so easy to use. So we want to think a little bit beyond that uh, to, to do it a little bit differently. 
Once we're clear on what we value, we want to consider the context for our evaluation. We hear many arguments about which indicators are responsible and which are not, and we can't have that conversation without knowing the context in which we sit, uh, the why and the what, uh, in, which, in which the indicator is going to be used. And so it's worth remembering that there are many reasons for evaluating, uh, and this metric here lists six key purposes <clears throat> along various entities of different sizes. And it attempts to indicate what the associated impacts and therefore the risks might be. So for an example, plotting the publication volume of one country against, against another country for the sole purpose of understanding their relative productivity levels uh, is very low impact on the countries under assessment. Uh, so we labeled that as green, as low impact. Uh, however, any form of, set of assessment at the level of an individual uh, that might result in a reward or a negative impact um, has high impact for that individual. And so we want to use uh, this kind of a matrix when we evaluate the context in which we're trying to evaluate responsibly. We also want to remember that the context matters, discipline matters. So what is valued in the arts and humanities might be something different in a biomedical type of field. And so that context for consideration uh, is, is really important. So the evaluative approach that works for folks in one discipline will not necessarily work in another. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that we always remember that. The next step in the, the process is options. And yes, we do have options. Uh, this is a reminder that we, we, we don't uh, always have to reach for metrics all the time. This is one. Uh, so, so the important thing to consider here is whether your indicator is a suitable proxy for things you're evaluating. We think the rule of thumb here is to generally speak quantitative, uh, that generally speaking, quantitative measures are general, genuine, usually for quantifiable things such as citations, publications, dollars or number of students, and that qualitative measures are for qualifiable things like quality, excellence, value, uh, and, and they can't necessarily be proxies for each, so we want to think through those as we go through the evaluation process. We should also uh, be especially careful when using quantitative indicators as a proxy for qualitative things. A highly cited candidate for a position uh, does not always equal a highly suitable candidate, and a candidate from a highly ranked institution does not always equal a better candidate than someone else. The next step in the scope process is probe, where we uh, have four key questions that we want to consider. Uh, those include who does this uh, evaluation discriminate against? Uh, how might this approach be gained? What might the unintended consequences of the approach be, both for the research culture within your community uh, and the ult ultimately on society itself? And finally, does the cost of measuring outweigh the actual benefit? Uh, okay. And then finally, uh, the E is for evaluation. The E in scope is to run your evaluation and then evaluate it. And while we um, present scope as a linear uh, linear step-by-step -step process, it really is, of course, a very iterative process. When we probe, we, we, we might determine that our context is a little, little different than what we thought, so we go back and adjust that. Uh, and so the evaluation is just making sure that we, we complete that evaluation, but then evaluate that process as well. Now, this was a really quick overview of the scope model. We do have a lot of more material available on our website uh, on the iNORMS working group. We had two topics to talk today about, so I wanted to go really quickly and present uh, the scope model in the most, uh, the, the simplest terms. And so here are some links uh, to that information where you can get additional information. I also would just wanna share here, uh, this is the group of international um, people all across the globe working on this uh, work along with Laura and myself. Uh, at this time, uh, we probably will turn it over to Laura and then at the end, if we have questions, we, we can go ahead and do that. 
Sounds good, Baron. And give me a moment, I'll just share my screen now. Oops, I think I've got the wrong So can you just give me a green light if I'm sharing a PowerPoint window here? I uh, see a lot. Uh, if uh, you go up now and just say swap displays, you should be good. There we go. Perfect. That's that. Okay. So, hi, everyone. Uh, along with Baron, um, I'm also a member of the Research Evaluation Working Group that is part of our uh, INORS. Uh, I work in research reporting and analysis at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada, which is close to Waterloo for, for uh, just for geographical reference. Um, I'm pleased to speak with you about our working group's second work package, which we call Rating the Rankers. And before I begin, uh, I just want to mention that the content of my talk is really based on a presentation we prepared for the INORMS uh, 2021 conference. Uh, and it has significant contributions from um, the two, two, uh, two people of that um, group, Justin Shear. He's from the University of Melbourne and Lizzie Gadd, uh, who is at Loughborough U uh, University. Okay, so the motivation for our work, uh, as research managers, we keenly feel the news when uh, our institutions perform well or poorly in the rankings. And for better or worse, the rankings uh, have, have a tendency to form a basis for the stories told about our universities. And as a result, our behaviors and decisions uh, can and or are uh, based on the results of those rankings. So we think that rankings products really have the potential to be useful, but most of these products have deficiencies which are limiting. And so what we really want as a community is to see rankings that are useful for research management and that better meet the needs of institutions globally. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the progress we've made as a working group. Uh, our first step, which was really the major uh, focus of the work, was to articulate a set of values of things that are important to us as research managers. Uh, I'll mention those values in my next slide. Um, we reached out to international organizations, um, primarily through the INORMS members, which, uh, which, which Baron and I are representatives of those organizations. Uh, I belong to CARA, which is the Canadian Association of Research Administrators. Um, we tried to identify what is important in our communities and get some feedback on that so we could present a unified customer voice on what we think would be a responsible ranking. And we next developed each value into a subset of criteria that could be scored. Uh, we validated those values and criteria. Uh, we completed a literature review of common problems associated with the rankings products. And then most recently, we ran a small pilot uh, for a small number of rankings products, six of them, and we invited them to participate in the process uh, with, we had some mixed, uh, mixed responses and varied responses. We rated how well those ranking products did against our, um, how they aligned to our articulated values. And in the process, we did engage uh, with independent external review. Uh, jumping ahead to our key findings, as Baron said, this is really just a teaser of our work. And uh, anyway, our key findings really were that no global ranking agency fully meets the community's expectations of best practices for responsible rankings. The four key values that we um, rated them on were governance, transparency, measuring what matters, and rigor. And some of those, I think, echo what Baron spoke about in terms of um, the model for responsible evaluation. And so while some agencies fared uh, better or worse than others within a specific uh, area or value, uh, they're really overall, there were really gaps between how they performed and how, what the community in, expects in terms of what we need from the rankings. Um, here's a slide with some uh, links to our work where it's been published. Uh, our initial findings were a blog post in the ARMA News. Perhaps some of you have already seen that. Um, uh, Lizzie was invited to prepare a paper or um, uh, a write-up in Nature. And um, the Mismeasuring Our Universities piece is available through the Center for Open Science. 
And most recently, um, there's a paper which has been accepted by the Scholarly Assessments Reports Journal and it's forthcoming. And all of these are available as preprints, which we can share with anyone who's interested. Um, for more information, I think just, uh, sorry, Baron already shared this slide. We can make the links available. And again, uh, just to reiterate that we're, we represent today a group of, uh, a larger group of international research management societies, and we're all volunteers uh, working towards these two work packages. So I think at this point we can take questions if there's time. That's super, Laura and, and uh, Baron. I, I was uh, glad to see that uh, your names popped up on the uh, speaker list uh, for this this conference because I, I when this when the iNorms publication came out last uh, last fall, I jumped on it, and in particular the um, the very colorful chart there that Baron was talking about, the uh, red, uh, amber, and green chart. I swiftly incorporated that into uh, my ongoing campaign to educate people about how not to do bibliometrics um, and because that's that's very useful very uh, concise way of thinking about it um, so uh let me go see if there's some questions just um off the top of my head uh, you know ranking the rankers is 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 brilliant that's that's uh that's very <laughs> meta, very meta i like very meta um the the current um thing that that uh, you know we talk about times higher education and um and QS all the various ranking systems, and I do remember that in your report it was the um, the Leiden Leiden uh, ranking system that came out the best as being the most transparent. Still not perfect, but um, but I, I've got a lot of familiarity with the Leiden data set, so I, I certainly uh, like using that. Um, the the one that I I it gives me the most headache is the UN SDG um, evaluation system, which naturally has been turned into a ranking. By -E. um, I, I wonder if I, I don't think that was covered in your report, um, but I would imagine that, that that's another type of ranking that you could use the iNorms checklist to evaluate. Um, any thoughts on the SDGs and how that might perform? Uh, well, I think in terms of next steps for the group, we're looking at just that is in terms of what to do next and where to take it next. Um, that's certainly one avenue is to look at other um other rankings that are out there including the sdgs uh so i can definitely something we can take back to to the group as we consider our future Sounds good. Yeah. um one little question is um so how would um you know you, what you're providing there through 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 inorms is a, a sort of a checklist of best practices and how to use bibliometrics responsibly. I was wondering how that differs from, say, you know, the Leiden Manifesto or the DORA principles, um, because there are a number of of um, best practices already defined out there. I mean, I, I, I love what you've done. I'm just trying to situate it in my head, how it, how it complements or supersedes them. I think we definitely um, took from each of those um, materials. So those were a foundation. Our, the, the purpose of much of the work package um, output is for um, practitioners and, and senior level managers to have something to go ahead and actually go for a process instead of an institution saying, we're signing on to DORA. Well, how do you then implement DORA? Well, maybe you could use the scope process to do that, to look at uh, the various entities. And, and, and when we think about uh, research evaluation, the scope model for responsible evaluation really can be applied to many different contexts. So we did a workshop with the University of Glasgow where we workshopped the value of supporting the careers of others. So how do we at the institution support the careers of others through the progression of becoming a full um, tenured academic? And, and so we use the scope process to do that. Uh, and in the end, it, it is research related because it's about those outputs that you value and things like that. So I think it's just a process um, to go hand in hand with those other um, those other materials that we really um, took a lot of information from in context. Oh, that's really that's super valuable because it makes it much more practical and uh, and applicable as opposed to being so, simply just a, an aspirational goal. Super. Well, thank you so much for for that talk. Um, and Laura, I'm 
I'm at uh, McMaster, and so I'm definitely going to be uh, contacting you as uh, I move forward with responsible metrics at, uh, at McMaster. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff.